Hey sisters, Kate here. I have been getting a ton of questions about our year this year because as Kara and I mentioned in the December episode, there have been some big changes in our family. So I thought it was appropriate to come on and to update everybody on the happenings over here. I feel like at this point, the year is partway over and we're halfway through. I thought I would come on and give you a little update, but I thought first it might make sense to give some context in case people who are listening are new or haven't listened to earlier episodes. I just want to tell you a little bit about our story before I go into this year because I think it will help tie it up neat, neat and tidy. I'm a school psychologist. I grew up in Massachusetts. My husband grew up in Massachusetts also. We both went to public school. There were no homeschoolers that I knew of. So when I tell you that homeschooling wasn't on my radar, I didn't think about it. It didn't occur to me. I didn't have feelings one way or the other because it just wasn't it wasn't something that was in my brain. I went to public school, like I just said, and then I ended up becoming a school psychologist and I worked in Boston and Chelsea and Lowell, if you're from the area, if you're a New Englander, I really love urban education. I loved what I was doing and I thought that I would have children stay home with them and then when they were school age, they would go to our local public school, which is a great district. We moved here for the district and then I would have the perfect mother's hours. I could see them after school and put them off on the bus and it would be great. And you just never assume things in life because life throws you curveballs. I have three children and it's it's very strange telling this story as I was thinking about what I wanted to say because when we started homeschooling, my oldest had, it, it all started, our decision to homeschool happened during his kindergarten year and I just signed him up for driver's ed. <laughs> He's about to turn 15. I can tell you that all those little old ladies in Target who tell you it goes by so fast, they were right, sisters. <laughs> they, were, they were so right. It's so fast. But so anyway, my children went to a play-based preschool locally that I loved. If you've been hanging around with me for any amount of time, then I'm a big play advocate. They had a great time in preschool. And then my son went to first grade. It was a half day program at the time. I should tell you a little bit about him first. He is a very unique learner. And I'll get into that more in a second. He was in kindergarten and he was reading Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit with comprehension. At the same time, he is the poster child for ADHD. He never stopped moving. He actually sleeps with his eyes open. <laughs> not even kidding. He, he just never stopped moving. His body, his thoughts, his words. He also had some pretty significant sensory challenges at the time. He was very sensitive to auditory input to the point that it would make him terrified. And he was a sensory seeker. So he was the kid that was always touching things and falling out of his chair and rubbing up against things and knock. He still does this, like, we'll just lean up against the bookshelf and then things are knocking off. In kindergarten, that looked like a kid who was very impulsive, couldn't stay in his chair, had lots of random observations and thoughts, was terrified of noises, heat, bells, fire alarms, annoying noises that your neighbor's making, things like that. Side note, just to give you an idea of how significant the auditory piece was, he was terrified of television. And people used to say to me, Kate, you're so lucky. He doesn't watch television. Like I can't get my kids off the television. But it wasn't a situation where I was lucky that he just didn't, didn't care for it and we didn't do a lot of it. It was a situation where you walk into your store, you walk into a new dentist's office for the very first time and there's a TV in the lobby and your kid screams and runs out the door and you have to chase him into the parking lot. Downright phobia level fear of television. So he did not actually watch any television at all and would be terrified of it. And let me tell you that televisions are everywhere. <laughs> They're everywhere. And people have little TVs in their pockets that they pull out and start watching the YouTube or something and he'd be screaming. So anyway, it's funny now. It wasn't funny then. He didn't watch TV until Frozen came out and I ended up bringing my daughter to the movie theater to watch it because it was such a big deal at the time and he got so jealous that I took her to the movie theater and I was like, buddy, 
it's very loud in there. It's a little, you can't watch the TV in our house. The movie theater, it's a lot for me sensory wise. We were in OT for sensory processing disorder. He didn't have a great kindergarten year. Like I said, it was a half day program. His teacher is a great teacher, but was not a good personality fit for him. He was a lot at that age. He could be a real nudge and I would go through the drive up picking him up every day around lunch and she would hand me a white slip. I don't know if that's what they were technically called, but it was a way for teachers to tell parents about things that went on during the day, usually behaviors that so that they didn't have to say it in front of the kid, but you could talk about it later. And so I got a lot of white slips. I just saw him losing his spark by day by day. He didn't like it there. He would have meltdowns at home. He told me that his teacher didn't like him. He felt like he was being corrected all the time. I think he was. Like I said, he was challenging. When he was in his play-based preschool, he had a teacher who saw the whole of him and loved him. She delighted in him and still to this day, I'm going to tear up, writes him letters several times a year and hand-drawn Christmas cards. And she saw all of his challenges too but she saw his strengths. She saw the whole kid. And I feel like in kindergarten, even though it's a great school district and even though it was a great teacher, they were seeing not all of him. And he was getting some labels like behavior. And they also couldn't accommodate their reading. Academically, he was way, way ahead. And they would put him in the high level reading groups that they do in kindergarten. But the fact of the matter was that he was not reading on the level of anyone probably in the building who was a kid, like the adults, but not not the kids. And uh, But he also couldn't sit still and couldn't... I remember his goal for the year, they each had a goal, and it, his was would get better at waiting. And I have to say, it's almost 15. He's still, that's still not his strength. I, I knew that he was a kid who had special needs, and I knew that he was a kid who also academically was gifted. I'm a school psychologist. I went to Tufts University for grad school. It's a great school, great program. However, we had one conversation on giftedness and we never talked about twice exceptional children and teens. And twice exceptional means that you are gifted in one or more areas, but you are also learning disabled. And that is what he was and it was more pronounced in the earlier years by a whole heck of a lot he's not my only kid who's 2e i just knew that the school psych programs weren't training you in that and so i didn't want to have him tested through the school i sought out someone who specialized in gifted students and twice exceptional students oh and i should say i was waiting for him to turn six he turned six in april and the reason why i did that was because being a school psychologist, there is one battery of tests that you use for children who are six and under. And then when you turn six, you are able to administer the same cognitive evaluation that you administer to a 16 year old. I knew that it would get a better picture if he tolerated the testing, which I wasn't sure if he would. Part of me thought I was wasting my money. I was doing it so that we would work with the school district to accommodate his needs. And, and I wanted it to paint the best picture of him, but I also worried that he wouldn't be able to sit still for testing and that it wouldn't be an accurate reflection of his abilities. So that's why I waited till six. So we were holding out part of that year. I have a post on my site called My Biggest Homeschool Regret. And after our first year of homeschooling, my biggest homeschool regret was that I didn't pull him out. I didn't know, again, it wasn't on my radar, so it's easy for me to say now. But knowing what I know now, I would have pulled him the heck out of that kindergarten situation a whole lot faster. So anyway, I was waiting for him to turn six. I drove upstate. He was six years, one month by the time we scheduled it. And it was a unique situation because the psychologist works in a district, but then does private evaluations out of her home. She was having construction done at the time. So I, they were in a room in her house, like on a porch, and I was in the driveway and I was reading books. And they would come out constantly. It was a nice spring day and he would come out for a break and he'd be bouncing around and, and climbing trees and chasing her dogs and her cats. And, and she gave him tons of breaks. She enjoyed him. <laughs> she, she got him. I remember an hour or so in, she came out and she tapped on my window and I rolled down my window and she said, Kate, we're not done. We've got a whole lot left to do, 
but I can tell you right now without a shred of doubt that he is profoundly gifted and you need to look up the Davidson Young Scholars Program while you're sitting here. So I said, thank you. I'd never heard of it before. I was like, profoundly get like what, what? And so she went back and they continued testing. Ultimately what ended up happening was he tolerated the testing very well and he actually came out after testing for hours and told me at that time it was the best day of his life. He enjoyed it so much and she enjoyed him so much. I think he was challenged. I think he had been in this situation. He's a kid, very inquisitive, very curious kid who just consumes knowledge and I think school had been tamping that light down and it lit him up. I looked up the Davidson Young Scholars Program. At the time they had a public forum, I don't know if they still do. Profoundly Gifted is scary smart, I'll just say that. And, and it comes with a lot of challenges, especially at that age because cognitively, so when he was taking these tests at age six, he was maxing out the subtests, the same ones that you would give to a 16 year old. But also, like I said, he had some pretty significant challenges and he cognitively understood things that emotionally his six-year-old body couldn't make sense of or process. The fears that he had, the very extreme anxiety that he had in those years were centering around things like the sun burning out. If the dinosaurs went extinct and we don't necessarily know why, who's to say that couldn't happen to us tomorrow? What? Why are we here? What's the point of life? Is there a God? All of this stuff that you're like, you're six. <laughs> you know? My whole point is that he was a very unique kid and remains to this day a very unique kid. When I met with a psychologist to consult after the fact, oh, and I should say, if you're listening and this is a story that you can relate to, the Davidson Young Scholars Program is a free resource for parents of profoundly gifted children and teens and it was a lifeline for me early in the early years you just have to send in your scores by a you know qualified evaluator and you're in and the they had a public facing forum that I learned a lot from in that car on that day while I waited for them to finish testing as I I bawled to be honest because I was just like how do you accommodate this in first grade and what does it mean for his future and his friendships and all of this. So my mind was swimming, but Davidson was a lifeline in the early years. They have private forum for parents and families. It was reassuring to see the, the struggles that we were having that at that time, a lot of my friends couldn't relate to. You have bedtime fears and then you have like existential dread at age six. And my friends are all awesome, but it was something that I can't explain to go into that community, especially in the early years, to be like, wow, this is other people's normal too. Like, this is a thing. It just helped me so much. So anyway, going back to when I met with the psychologist to go over the results, it was like a week later or something that she scored it and gave the report. And I was like, I don't know that the public school is going to be able to accommodate this. I don't even know what that would look like. Do we send him to private school? Do we send him to a charter school? And she was like, listen, Kate, you can do whatever you want but I've been working with this population for many years and I can tell you that in the state of New Hampshire, there is no school that can accommodate this at this age. And if you send them to a private school, you're gonna be paying to have the same situation that you're having right now in the public school. And the best outcome that she had seen as far as being able to meet a profoundly gifted and twice exceptional child's academic, social, and emotional needs was to homeschool. Reading the Davidson when I was in her car, homeschool started to be on my radar because a lot of the parents were homeschooling or partially homeschooling, especially in the earlier years. So when she said this, it, w it had been a little bit on my radar. And then it was all of a sudden there and I was like, how do I do this? I don't know anything about homeschooling. And immediately your mind starts to spiral and you're thinking, let's be honest, he's smarter than I am. He's been smarter than I am for a very long time, and I consider myself to be a fairly intelligent woman. But how do I teach him? He's gonna surpass me in math in pretty short time, and he did. How do I teach a kid who is smarter than I am? And she said, I've worked with parents forever. I know where you're going, I know where your mind's going. And she's like, what you need to do, and I've held on to this advice for years, 
it's easier now than it was then. She said, what you need to do is to try as hard as you can to not think more than six months ahead and worst case, a year. Do not think beyond a year. Do not think of middle school. Do not think of high school. Do not think of college. None of that. Just six months at a time. And so that's what I tried to do. So his first grade year, we homeschooled. And my younger two were still in the beloved Playbees preschool. I was actually on the board of directors for the preschool. In retrospect, that's something that was a very hard year. And it's something that I should have just said and everyone would have understood. Things have changed here. And could someone else be the director? Because there's a lot <laughs> happening in our house. That would have been the smart thing to do. I actually made a lot of friends out of it. So it was all worth it. But it, it was a hard year. It was a year of transition. There was a huge part of me that thought that we would drive each other bananas being together the entire day without a television. He was awesome, but just very challenging at that age. And everyone in Davidson told me it'll get easier around seven, eight, nine. And it did. So if you are Kate like back in time and you're relating to any of this it really does and I know at the time you're like that is so far away but it did and then you look back on the more challenging times and you're like wow that was a lot that I didn't realize even though I thought it was a lot at the time and also just what a cool kid <laughs> you know what I mean what an interesting kid so anyway that was 2014 all of my friends were like this is the most fascinating story. I have all these school psych friends that I had been working with. I was planning to go back when everyone was in school full time. So I would see my friends and they were like, this is just fascinating. And I asked them too, did you learn anything about testing for giftedness or twice exceptional? And they were all like, no. And they all went to good school. So they were fascinated by the whole story. And they're like, you need to keep us updated, start a block. And I was like, what? Cause I am not technical, but I did. I started a blog back on like blog spot or whatever it was and I called it my little poppies because there is an article about I'll link it in the replay I'm blanking on the title right now but it's about trying to keep everybody at the same level and trimming the poppies so that all the poppies grow at the same level I called my kids my little poppies because the essay just was meaningful to me I was not an impulsive person but part of me felt like if if I say I'm homeschooling and I have a blog saying I'm homeschooling like I have to actually do it you know it's like holding me accountable because I couldn't believe that this was the story that we were in I didn't know any homeschoolers it probably took us a good three years to find homeschoolers who we had things in common with. I'm often jealous of my friends in different parts of the country that have these big homeschool communities, but that's just not the case where I am. So I started My Little Poppies and I chronicled our days for my education friends. 100% did not think that anybody on the planet would find it, let alone read it. But when you tell your story, there are people out there that have a very similar story. And I met such an amazing community of parents. I have many of these parents in Neverboard Learning. We have very unique learners in Neverboard Learning. The, the people who have been with me the longest are the parents or grandparents or teachers of twice exceptional kids. And so if you're listening and you're one of them, I see you. <laughs> I ended up developing this My Little Poppies community of readers, and it felt good to meet people who were walking a similar path and to be honest about it and how hard it was and how cool it was and how fascinating it was and how tiring it was. And that's how My Little Poppies started. And I worked really hard to try to find people who I could connect with who were also homeschooling because I live in a town that's a great school district. People move here to send their kids to the public school. There's no homeschoolers in my neighborhood. And we are secular homeschoolers. A lot of the homeschools I were finding in this area at the time were religious. And I'm 100% okay with that. But I just, I was like, how do I do the school part? <laughs> the, the, the rest of the stuff, I got it. But what does the homeschooling part look like? Can we just whittle it down so that I can figure this out? And uh, so that's how I found Kara and how I found Shauna. Kara did not set out to homeschool. And she wrote this article about how her son wouldn't sit on the line. We talked about it 
a little bit, I think in December, or maybe I'm thinking of a Nevermore Learning event, but I can find the article and link it. And I was just like, my kid won't sit on the line either. I read her blog and left comments. Shauna wrote all of these articles about kids who have so many sensory needs and it was so relatable to me. And I always say that I stalked them on the internet and made them my friends. I ended up eventually writing for Simple Homeschool, which was bananas to me because I was like, how am I writing about homeschooling? Because I don't really know what I'm doing. What ended up happening with my other two, they were in the play-based preschool. And then my daughter went to kindergarten. She had a great teacher, loved her teacher, loved her friends from preschool. Many of them went to she was in school with them. First grade, still friends with many of them now. And she loved it at first. She loved the free play that they did. She loved the books they read. But then she would tell me as September and October wore on, she was like, they're starting to do more. I forget how she said it, but like basically they were introducing more structure and getting a little more academic in the day. She didn't like that part. And we had a similar issue with the reading. Her teacher at conferences was like, there's no cohort for her. She didn't try to tell me there was a cohort. When we had my son's meeting, the school psychologist was telling us, I've never seen a kid with scores like this in kindergarten. And then in the same breath, she'd be like, but we have a cohort for him of students who are reading above grade level. But my daughter's teacher was like, hey, I know you're homeschooling. You can do whatever you want, but there is no cohort for her here right now. And she was like, I, if you're already homeschooling, she might do well there. My daughter ended up writing in her big kindergarten script. She ended up writing something that we called her homeschool manifesto. I have an article on My Little Poppies. It's ancient. And she wrote all the reasons why she wanted to homeschool because when you're homeschooling in the early years, I was homeschooling first grade. He's done in like a minute. And then we would be outside because he's a kid to this day. He needs to be outside. And so we spent hours outside in the early years. We went to farms. We hiked in the woods. She wanted to do that too. She was very aware that she was in school and she liked her teacher. She liked her friends, but she knew that we were out doing fun things. So she asked to come home. So around Thanksgiving, we brought her home. And then my little guy was at the play-based preschool that I was on the board of directors for. I have a post on my site about this too, but he went through a phase of not wearing pants. Like he just wouldn't put them on in the morning and he needed to go to school two days a week and I'd have to like wrestle them on the child. And then if I turned my back for a second, the pants would be off again. We called him the pantsless wonder. It didn't last forever. He wears pants now, but it made for a very hard year. We were always late because of it. It was this big battle. I remember one day I was actually hosting a board meeting at my house for the preschool. I had this thought in my head, like, what am I doing? I have two kids at home. I'm stressing myself out to drive this kid to a two day a week preschool that he loved when he was there and he kept his pants on at school, thank goodness. I was like, why am I doing this every day? So I pulled him out, <laughs> which was awkward because I was on the board. I was like, he's going to homeschool him now. So he's never been to public school to this point. My daughter did a minute and my oldest son did a year up until this year. Like I said, the psychologist told us never think more than a year ahead. And I've really tried to do that. I didn't set out to homeschool. I've loved it. It has been so fun. I can't believe this is our ninth year. I have learned so much and I'll talk about that, but we would assess it every year. And I remember Kara and I talking about this too on the podcast. We never said we were going to homeschool till college or whatever. Every year I would ask the kids, do you want to homeschool next year? And they a hundred percent every year know that if they want to, they could go back. My daughter, every summer we go to a pool locally. It's not fancy at all. It's like in the woods. We've grown up with the families there and they all go to public school. My daughter has friends to this day that she knew in preschool. She is by far my most social. She loves her friends. She needs to see her friends all the time. And every year she would consider it. It always happened at the end of the summer when the kids would start talking about bus routes and teachers and in the later years, what team are you on? And where is your locker? And are you decorating it? Things like that. She would think about it. Every year I was like, she might go. Last school year, these conversations happened before summer. The year was almost over and she was like, I want to. She was really nervous about it. In our school district, middle school starts in seventh grade and we are a cooperative district. So it's two towns joining together for seventh grade. I think <laughs> seventh grade is the worst year. I love middle schoolers, but I think it's a very hard year. And so my mother heart has been worried about that right along. 
But as far as timing goes, it is a good time to try public school because you don't stand out as the new kid. Everybody feels new because it's two towns meeting up and the other town is just going to assume that you're from the other one. You know what I mean? Timing wise, it was a good opportunity to try it. My son for the last several years has been saying he wanted to try high school, either our public high school or there's a charter nearby that he considered for a little bit before deciding to try our high school. For years now, that was something that he thought he was going to do. I definitely knew this time last year that my son would be going to public high school. My daughter started deciding a little bit later, late spring maybe. So big change, right? They're they're in school now. My oldest is a freshman at our local high school. He is doing great. He did say that part of him was wishing like the two towns came together for ninth grade. He's not as social as my daughter. So it took him a couple months to get his footing there as far as making friends. He's been doing Boy Scouts forever. And so he has friends from Scouts at the high school that are not necessarily in his grade. As far as finding a group of buddies in your grade, that took a little bit longer. My daughter went like, whew, she was, she was fine. I joked on the, the episode that Karen and I did in December, we had conferences pretty early on in the year. I want to say it was still September, maybe. She's a sweetheart of the kids. They all really love her. No complaints or anything. But two different teachers were like, I can't even believe she was homeschooled. You can't tell. And they didn't mean it insulting, but it was just, as a homeschooler, it was just so funny. I laughed (laughs) and they would back up and be like, oh, I just mean in terms of she came in and socially, she just I thought she knew everybody, and she did. She knew a lot of people, but her adjustment was 100% fine in that regard. She has auditory processing disorder, and it's pretty significant. The school worked with us super awesome about getting her on a 504, which she really has not needed, and that was a happy surprise because she has trouble here when there's just three students. What's it going to be like in a classroom? But she has rocked it. And my oldest, I know that the parents of two E kids are going to ask. They asked me to give a transcript. I gave a transcript. I gave the cognitive scores. I struggled with the the gatekeeper of the high school as the head guidance person. And I don't think she liked us. I would bet the farm that she had an idea of what homeschoolers were like before she met with us. I also know that I am in a district where everybody is pushing their kids to be in classes. I know people who put their kids in extra math class so that they can take advantage of the system and get their incoming seventh grader on a track so that they can be in pre-algebra. You know what I mean? There's a lot of really smart people in this district, and there's a lot of people who are very focused on college and achievement and pushing their children to be involved in many different things so that it looks good on a transcript. And to each his own, But I think she was probably thinking, here's another parent who thinks her kid is super smart and needs to be in these classes. I think she was also thinking, here's a homeschooler who made this transcript that thinks her curriculum is all accelerated, but we are a blue ribbon school district and we get top scores. So I think there was a lot of that going on. I'll also say, funny story, is that first impressions are meaningful and our first impression was a weird one because we met over Zoom in July. We were supposed to meet in person, but my husband and I got COVID after a big long run. He ended up getting it on his 50th birthday, basically. So we were in quarantine at my house. I couldn't go to school to meet with her, obviously. My two boys went to a week-long summer camp for scouts. They came back to to my husband and I having COVID, and my daughter actually then tested positive, was completely asymptomatic and just miserable (laughs) to be with in the house because she wanted to be at the pool, and she couldn't, and she felt 100% fine. So that was, it was a really fun week, but my oldest was scheduled to leave for the, the scouts big trip, which is something that the boys plan for years. They were going to the Canadian Rockies. They were going to Banff. And he was terrified that he was going to catch COVID from us. And 
that he would not be able to go because that was a big concern, the testing and leaving the country and everything. So he was, I kid you not, it was July, it was 900 degrees. He was sleeping outside. He was eating out. He'd only come inside to go to the bathroom. And when he came inside, he was masked because he was just hell bent. I am getting to Canada. And he did. And he saw a white grizzly bear, which is like seeing a unicorn. Look that up. I'll, I'll get a picture. It's really amazing. He had the trip of a lifetime. But I'm telling you this because we met on Zoom and he had to be in the meeting with me on Zoom. So here we are, homeschoolers, sitting in our kitchen, both wearing masks. I took the mask off so she could actually hear me, but he's wearing a mask and he's like really put out number one, that he has to meet with the guidance counselor, and number two, that he has to sit next to me being COVID positive because he wants to leave for Canada. So I think we just looked weird and I explained, like I tried to make a joke out of it and explain that he's trying to go to Canada, but I think she was just like, don't know about these people. Did he get into the classes that he should be in? Yes and no. He's doing fine. The biggest trouble we had with was with math and that could be a whole other podcast in and of itself. He has been doing art of problem solving for many years. Math is a strength that comes easily to him. He's always tested off the charts for math. This is the thing that really burned my biscuits the most is that I think you can fake a lot of stuff probably in these situations, but I, I don't think you can fake math. If you're really good at math, that isn't something that you can just act like you're really good at math. <laughs> do you know what I mean? She was actually rotten to him as far as making him do a whole bunch of testing on his last day. She was also really disorganized. I hope she's not listening to this, but hi. <laughs> it's me. Hi, it's me. But anyway, the long and the short of it is he's in accelerated algebra two, and he's already taken that. He should be in accelerated pre-calculus. Actually, I stopped him when I knew he was going back to school. His last math class wrapped up in January. So all of spring semester last year, he just didn't do math because I was like, if I put you in pre-calc now, what do you do freshman year? And the thing is that they could accommodate him. They don't want to. I remember her in the meeting when I said that he should be in accelerated pre-calc. She said, we can't do that. He will run out of math. <laughs> It's like, can we cross that bridge when we get there? Anyway, I'm not going to ramble on about this. He has a 105 average in math. He's got a really good friend. I think I maybe told this story on Sisters ages ago, but when we were first homeschooling, we spent so much time with the library. The librarians loved him. Talk about who sees your kids and appreciates the whole of them. Librarians have always loved him. They used to say to me, Kate, there is another kid in town who is like him <laughs> and they were like they they need to meet and for privacy reasons i can't tell you his name but you guys are both here so much one of these days you're going to cross paths and one day we were in the library at the same time and the librarians were so joyful they introduced us i would completely hit it off with the mom he was one year younger than my oldest and we ended up being on a destination imagination team early on and as the kids got older, they grew apart just because life gets busy and he was in public school or homeschooled. But we would always periodically check in. And now he was great accelerated in middle school and in, is now in my son's grade. So they're both in math together. And the math teacher really loves and lets them make origami and paper airplanes if they're done, just as long as they're quiet and clean up. And the, the funny thing is that we went through this whole thing about math that could be another podcast that I just won't go into. But they were like, yeah, we can't do that. But also, would he be interested in being on the math team? <laughs> and he's like, I'm not going to be on the math team. They're not even putting me where I'm supposed to be. So he's not on the math team. He is doing the ski team, which has been really great. So he's doing great. My daughter's doing ski club. She changed to a different swim team that practices more. So she's been doing that this year. She switched to voice lessons from piano with our same teacher. My oldest switched from piano to guitar lessons. It's been really fun to watch them grow up and grow into themselves. I just love teenagers when they're not driving you absolutely bananas. They're just such cool, interesting people. I am so grateful that we were given this curveball where I was able to spend so much time with them, especially in the early years, to just let them be themselves without any sort of peer. It's not cool to be really into like cuttlefish or whatever the thing was at the time. It just, I, I feel like they were able to grow it into themselves. They were able to remain 
children longer, if that makes sense. Like we just played so much. If you guys follow me on Instagram or anything, you probably know about Linda, my filthy fourth child. She's this doll that my daughter was given on her second birthday. And she named her Linda, which was just like, we don't know any Lindas. And it was just such a funny name because growing up, all my friends' moms were named Linda, but my daughter was two. And I was like, who's Linda? But she is like our velveteen rabbit. And when I tell you, my daughter and my youngest have played with her up until this year. She doesn't come out that much anymore, but Linda had a hell of a run, (laughs) to be honest. And I don't think she would have if my daughter was in school. You know what I mean? They were allowed to play with dolls until she turned 13. I just think there's something to say for that. They had so much time outside. They had so much time to read. Like the knowledge that is gained just from the amount of reading that your children are allowed to do with books that they are interested in is just amazing to me now. My son is in, he has midterms this week and he's in an accelerated English class and they are reading To Kill a Mockingbird, which he had already read. He's read everything and he liked it the first time around. This time he's, he's enjoying school. He's very funny talking about the annoying parts of it. And he, he's like, it's like beating a dead horse. You and I would read something and have a conversation about it. And if I had a question, I'd ask it and it'd be done. It's like, what does the quote on page 35 mean? And all of this. So it's funny because they see both sides of it. They're both excited to be where they are and they're enjoying it, even though there's parts of it that they don't like. What have I learned from all of this? I have learned so much. Homeschooling was the best curveball ever. I had never even thought of it. I worried that I wouldn't be good at it and we figured it out. And The early years were so great. We spent so much time outdoors. We spent so much time playing. We did our academic stuff, but I'm telling you now, if you're listening and you're just early on in your journey, you don't need to do a lot. If your kids are little, you can learn it all later. There are windows that open and your kids will just devour information. You don't have to feed it to them. They'll take it. Kids are so good at learning. If you have little ones, read them books every day. Read them books, listen to books, go for walks, go to the farm. Everything you do is a field trip. Talk, the conversations you have, play, play a ton. Let them free play. Let them have at it. Rough play, mud play, pretend play, whatever. Put your feet up, have a cup of coffee and just let them do that. It's so special that we were able to do that. Those hours would have been consumed with other things. And my son said today about a, To Kill a Mockingbird, he's like, I think if I had read this this year for the first time, I wouldn't have liked it. And he did like it. He's like, she's making me not like it because I'm kind of done talking <laughs> talking about it. So just let them be kids and focus less in the early years on the academics because there's time for that. I just got off a conversation actually in Never Bored Learning with a mom who has kids my age who has been homeschooling from the beginning and we were talking about that. It just all goes by so fast and it all works out. They're always going to have things they're good at. They're always going to have things they struggle with. That's not going to change. I'm 44 and I have things I'm good at and I have things I struggle with and It's never going to change. Just focus on the connection. Let them be kids. Play. Read a ton. Spend time outside. Because when they hit middle school and high school, even if you're homeschooling, I can tell you the last couple years for us, there's less space to do those things that you're doing now because they have their other interests. And a lot of times, I know my kids were interested in online learning. And then you're taking very interesting classes, but They're at various times of the day and you have three kids and it just gets harder to be able to take an entire, we used to spend entire days out in the woods and it was magical. Was it perfect? No. Were people crying? Sure. Did someone fall and scrape something? Yes. Did someone get stung by a bee? Yes. It wasn't perfect, but you have so much more time than you think you do. I've also learned that so much work that we do, so much social emotional work that doesn't happen in school because there's not space for it. You know, it happens a little bit, but my son struggled with really significant anxiety, really significant fears, not just television. I, I tell this story now. In January of 2019, Martin Luther King Day, 
that week, my son was terrified of global pandemics. No, I'm not making it up. We have a therapist that we've seen off and on for years whenever we need to. She also works with twice exceptional kids, has a couple of her own and gets him and is always great with him. So we'll see her for a bit until it passes because it always eventually does. That's what he was afraid of because my husband works in the ICU. He's an, a pulmonologist and he would work with the patients if that were to occur. With animal viruses crossing over into humans. Scientists have been saying for years that we're due, that it's probably going to be a respiratory type situation. And she would sit him down and they would talk and she'd talk statistics. She'd say, what do you think the chances? And he would come back at her. He does every time. They're like, it's a battle of wits. I think if you had told me in January or February or March of 2019, that a year later, that his fear would come true, I think I would have been committed. Like I'm, it was such a hard time. And cut to March of 2020, I'm thinking, wow, this might be not good for him. And he was just, mom, I told you. <laughs> and were people anxious? Yes, because especially in the beginning, they didn't know anything then. There was a lot of unknowns. And when you have a kid who struggles with anxiety, that makes it hard. I'm telling you this because we worked on social, emotional, and heart type stuff early on, like when he was in OT, making sure we did that sensory diet every single day, making sure he got enough exercise, that he was doing heavy work and all of these things. And playing games in the early years. He was a kid who didn't like to lose. He still doesn't like to lose. He was super competitive and nobody wanted to play with him and he could be rude and we would work with that. And those skills that you're doing every day, helping the kids who can't fall asleep at night because they're afraid of global pandemics of a respiratory nature that their dad will have to treat, that is not academic, but it's important. I feel like those are skills that you can never learn too early. We're all going to have to cope with crud in our lives. You know what I mean? Anyway, cut to 2020. My kids are almost 15, 13, and 11 right now in 2023. This was 2020. When I tell you that during 2020, I said, this is a lot. We have some anxiety in the house. It's uh, very weird and confusing especially er the early part of it for everybody. And there were so many unknowns. We just walked in the woods. We wandered in the woods. Sometimes we walked eight miles over the course of seven hours. We had lunch outside. We sometimes had dinner outside and we didn't do school. I would do read aloud. We always did a read, read aloud. In the car, we had an audiobook, but we just spent time together in the woods. We walked and we talked and we saw so much nature. We had always done a lot of nature, but we did so much nature in 2020. I just said hearts over heads. There's no magic classroom where people are getting straight A's and doing really well cognitively and socially, emotionally in a global pandemic. It's not happening. Everything's on pause. It's weird. It's going to be written about. There's going to be repercussions for years and years that we will discover later. We walked in the woods. We did very little school. They were, in, what, in middle school? And... They're fine. I sent them to public school. They're fine. They're not having any trouble. <laughs> Knock on wood. They're fine. We took an entire year basically off in middle school and we're okay. I just want to let you know that. I think it's really important that we're able to, to do that because think about nobody was in school then, the time period I'm talking about, but think about a kid that's going through some sort of a mental health situation and they can't focus in school, but they're still expected to be there. And you're not learning when you have huge worries. You're not taking in that information. You're too distracted. They just miss that. So it's okay to pause and just be like, we're just not doing this now. It's not a good time. And I don't know when it's going to be a t good time again, but we're just not doing it. So we just didn't do school. We did math. They were do taking piano at the time, so they would practice a little bit. And like I said, we read. And aside from that, and we're, we're okay. We came out of it and we're okay. I think that's something that I learned. And I can tell you now when I look back at, we used to call it his worry wins when he was little. He 
He had a ton of fears, ton of fears early on that he conquered. And as soon as one would go away, there'd be another. And we have so many wins. I have to think that we were more successful with our wins in homeschool because that was our focus. We had the time to focus on it. If you're having a panic attack, what do you do? Walk through steps and how do you cope and how do you manage stress? And we did a lot of mindfulness and they all will seek that out on their own independently at different times now. We have Peloton, so they'll go on and they'll do a little like five minute meditation on their own. And I can't think, I don't think if they were all in public school, in elementary school, that I would even have the time to even think about having a mindfulness habit. You know what I mean? There just wouldn't have been enough time. So you have so much more time than you think. That's what I want to let you know. I want to reiterate, the kids are really good at learning throughout our homeschool journey, became more and more unschooly. In one of the episodes, I told you how I got kicked out of a local unschooler Facebook group because the head lady said that I wasn't an unschooler because we read too many I was like too academic but my I have a kid who reads biology textbooks for fun I'm not forcing him to we have always dabbled in a million different bits of curricula and I, I really learned though to just trust the kids and there's no need for a discrete we do math but you don't have to be like, this is my geography, and this is my English, and this is my history, these separate things, because they're all together. Everything is connected. And so if your kids are really interested in cuttlefish or the Humboldt squid or ring-tailed lemurs, I'm going through like some of our obsessions, you can, you can explore that. I love lazy unit studies. It's not anything complicated. It's basically just learning alongside your kid and making sure you get, you got books. Okay. You like ring till lemurs. Let's read these books and let's leave these books out on the coffee table and let's see if there's ring till lemurs in any sort of show. And are there any locally that we can go visit? And let's write something about you. Everything you can just take it. And when the kid is interested in that when you are following their interests even if it's something like you know, like roblox it doesn't like anything they will learn i i always tell the story my boys got really into memoir 44 in 2019 it's a world war ii game really into it and that winter they played it constantly they still play it and papa my father-in-law loved loves world war ii history and knows all the aircraft and battles and they were, this was years ago now when you're thinking about it, but they know more about World War II than I do right now or that I did in high school when I was studying it and I did well in history because they're interested in it and they're playing with it and they're lost in these battles in the game that were the actual battles. There's so much to be said for interest-based learning and play no matter why you homeschool, some of us were homeschooled. Some of us knew it was always something that we wanted to do. And others of us just landed here like me. Whatever the reason, it's because the traditional method, the box, because it has to be a box in public school because there's so many people. You have to group people. That box wasn't going to work for us or maybe we tried it and it wasn't working even if we wanted it to i know a lot of people are really reluctant homeschoolers too and i want to let you know i see you a lot of people don't want to be here but they are because we do it for our kids it doesn't need to look like school because that wasn't working so it makes sense to think outside of the box and to step outside of the box and i know it can be scary Because you're like, how does this game count as learning? How does this free play that my kids, how is that counted as learning? If you are homeschooling, whether you plan to be here, you don't want to be here, or you're unexpectedly here, try to separate the school piece from the education piece. Pull the school and the learning apart. I was a good student. I went to a good school district. I liked some of my classes. I didn't like some of my others. But now when I think back, the learning was so much different. I I have loved learning alongside my kids with what they're interested in. I have learned so much more. I have retained so much more and I'm getting older. There's just something to be said for that type of interest-based learning versus being fed it because that's what you learn in fourth, fifth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth grade. You know what I mean? My advice would be 
to trust yourself. You've got this. Focus on connection over academics always. Playing a game with your kid first thing in the morning may seem like a risk. It may seem like it doesn't count. You might be worried you won't get to all the things on your to-do list, but if you take that moment, first of all, play is learning, but even if you're not there with me yet, if you take that moment to connect with your kid, it sets the day off and running. You're connected, your kids are gonna be more cooperative, people will tend to be in better moods, more things actually can get accomplished when you take the time to prioritize the connection. Read, your read aloud, your daily read aloud is the most important part of your entire day. There's research like how incredibly important it is for your children to delight in the story. If you raise a kid who loves a story, you'll raise a reader and a reader can learn anything. The soft skills, those non-academic skills, the coping with frustration, the, the managing anxiety, the manners, whatever therapies your kids are in right now, those are all incredibly important. And you may feel like you're not getting to the academics, but I'm here to tell you that the effort you're putting in right now, even though it feels like nothing is happening or very little is happening, it's happening. And you're gonna be so proud of yourself later. Play matters, make space for play. Research shows that it's not just important for your children, it's also important for your teens and it's important for you. And there is actually research on that. You'll be happier. Play can transform your homeschool environment and it can actually change your entire family. I have parents all the time in Never Were Learning talking about how play has changed their family for the better and how play has gotten them through really challenging times. The other thing I like to think about is I had Mary Wilson from Celebrate a Book into Never Bored Learning our, the first year that we were open, so in 2021, and we were talking about, at that time, we were talking about playing with books and playing in your homeschool and what that looks like as your kids get older, because it does get harder to sit down when you have tweens and teens and play as many games as we used to play in the early years. It gets harder just because kids are busier and they're having their interests and their classes and all of this. But Mary said something to me that I just loved. She said that she tries to be a student of her child. Learn from your kid, learn with your kid, honor their interests, be interested in their interests. Mary talked about playing Fortnite with her kiddos who were interested in Fortnite even though it wasn't her favorite thing, about watching an entire anime series because her daughter was interested in it. Taking time to play with and be interested in your kids' interests are things that I think they're gonna remember always. We're talking like core memory type things. I would also like to reiterate that conversations count and that all the conversations you're having are important. The jokes that you have about books you've read or shows you watched, all those conversations, the connections that are made over the table in public school, there's no way to measure or to grade the conversation. And so it's not something that we're taught to acknowledge even as a type of learning. But I would say that our read alouds every day and the conversations that came from them were the spine of our learning for years. I should probably mention that my youngest and I are having a great year. He's living his best life. He's doing every, he, during the teen years, hormones come in and kids sleep a little later and they're a little harder to light a fire under them when they first get up. So everything's a little slower and it makes for a sh less time in the day. So he's very excited that he can get his home. He calls it banging out his homeschooling. Gets up, I'm going to bang it out. And then we have the day with like, we've gone back in time a bit where we have more free time at least until the kids get out of school and he's doing awesome he is thinking about going back next year he has a bunch of friends from scouts who really want him to go back and he is listening to my two bigs talk about just how our schools work that my daughter entered when another town was entering when my son didn't and he thinks that he's telling him i think it would be easier seventh grade you know, and then he doesn't know because then he's, but I might just want, that's a long, they're gone a long time. I don't know what will happen and we'll assess when we get there, but didn't mean to just like brush over him. But I know people have been asking about the big, so I wanted to focus on that. I would just tell you to trust your kid and your teen. Teens are so fun. Some of the, as they get older in your homeschool, some of those battles that you have, like I'll, like my youngest has always hated writing. He has great ideas, but doesn't like to put them on paper. 
and would battle me for years, would mathematically figure out the fewest possible letters needed to complete whatever little writing thing I was asking him to do a day. And kids just get more mature and you can have a conversation with them. And I just want you to know that this eventually happens. And I'm not the only person because I've talked about this with a bunch of people in Never Bored Learning lately. I talked about it with Shauna. I talked about it with Kara. You can just be. He's in sixth grade now. Buddy, you need to write. This is just something we do. How many times do I pick up a pen during the day? It's a life skill. And also, if you're even considering for a hot minute going back to public school, or not back, he never went... <laughs> If you're considering going to public school, you can't show up and just be like, I don't like doing that. And so he this year is, he doesn't like it, but he's writing and he's writing every day and he's making jokes about it, but he's not complaining about it because he knows this is some, I got to do it. Like, it's just like laundry. It's there. You got to do it. It's something that just is going to be there. And we all have things we like and we all have things we don't, but you just got to do your best. I would let you know that those battles get a little easier as they get a little bit more mature. And then the other thing that I wanted to touch on <clears throat> that I'm saving for the end because I was afraid that I would start crying if I st talked about it at the beginning. I don't think that it's having two kids in school now. I think it's the ages that they're at. I'm so incredibly grateful for the time that we've had and so acutely aware of how our window of them at home is shrinking. I'm just so aware of it. And so I just have this, I have so many feelings and I'm actually going to have a mom on the podcast. I have a mom coming up who is homeschooling high school. She has four children. Her oldest is in high school. She used to be afraid of homeschooling high school, but now she's like really relaxed about it and she's rocking it. I also have a mom on who you're going to know, so you're going to be excited. She has kids who are older than mine. She's been homeschooling right along. Her oldest who asked to go back this year and her youngest is at home. And we're going to talk about that because she and I have talked about how there's all these feelings. I'm excited for them. Like I'm so excited for them. I have learned to follow their lead. It, it took a while at the beginning to trust that it was going to be okay, but kids are really good at learning. And like I said, we've been following their interests for years. I want them to be them. I want them to do what they are interested in. And if that's public school, have at it. And I'm here for you. I'm a cheerleader. So I'm excited for them. I was also so worried, like so worried. Will people be nice to them? Will there be social stuff that comes up will their teachers get them like they they both have some unique things going on i just wanted to make sure that they were going to be okay i'm so grateful for the time that i have with them it's also bittersweet i'm enjoying this year very much but there are all these things that we all did together that now there's two of us doing it and it feels like we're cheating doing it without them but also they're at school and they wouldn't be able to. For birthdays, we always do a scavenger hunt of gifts. And it's usually something that the kids come up with themselves. And they're really weird, off the wall clues and like cryptic. They've been doing it for years. And he's a September baby. It's a Labor Day baby. And there was no way to make it work on his actual birthday with what was going on in the like school beginning and I had to do the clues and videotape it and show it to them and we had a really fun day I took him to a game store he's my biggest gamer we went to a game store where you can play tests and they also have all these minifigs and they have pokemon and we had the best day but it was weird and that's an extreme example because it's a birthday but there's been a hundred things like that where I'm like ah oh, I wish so-and-so was here so I could tell them that and then you're like they're oh they're not here <laughs> So it's weird. There's also, I was thinking about how to even phrase this because I don't want it to be misconstrued, but I'm going to say it anyway. Having two in school, there's some relief there. There's some relief there because I think you're always afraid. What if something happens in my life? What if I get really sick and I can't homeschool or any number of like really re weird random things that happen and they have to go to school? Will they be okay? And they are. And then there's also for one kid that's battled me on math forever. I don't have to do that anymore. The, the math is going better, I think, because the teacher is not her mother. And so the, the dynamic is different and 
it's not as stressful. So there's relief that they're okay. And also that some parts of it that weren't my favorite, I don't have to do right now. I'm also really proud of them. I didn't know what school would be like for them. And I didn't know what homework would be like. I had this thought that they would come home and the homework hour would be like when kids used to come home from preschool or something and they'd melt down because they were just so tired. Like they held it together all day. I, I was expecting that. And I haven't had that. There's been barely any homework that's come home because they each have a study. And I think because of homeschooling and the banging it out, which we've always said, like, I'm going to just bang it out so I can get this done. They know if I'm at school already. I have to do this by tomorrow. Why am I going to wait till I'm home? I'm just going to get it done now. And then I have my afternoon free to not have to do this. I can count on one hand the number of times together that they've had homework here. And we're halfway through the year. I'm floored that it went by so fast. I would say my two, I'm gonna pick three words. I am so grateful for all the time we had together for this curveball, for this journey, for the fact that I met this whole community that I didn't even know exists, like I didn't even think about. I've made so many friends. I had a podcast. I'd never even heard of a podcast. I met Kara, I met Sean. I made these lifelong friends and a larger community of people who are doing this. Never bored learning. I, it has been so fun, so fun to be in a space where you just embrace your unique kid and you delight in their interests and you think of creative ways to meet their needs and you celebrate their uniqueness and you play. You have more fun than I think we often allow. We spend so much time worrying if we're doing enough and we wake up at three in the morning and taking a, a curly example is during the Olympics one time your kid asks if Paris is in New York and you think you're failing and you're doing okay and you can actually be having more fun than you allow. And so I'm really grateful for the time that I had with my kids, for the curveball they threw me, for all the learning we did, all the memories we made, all the books we read together, so many more books. I've always been a reader. I always intended to read some of them every day, but we read so many more books than we would have been able to had they been in school. They learned so much. They had time to be kids, to play when society is telling you that it's more important things to do. They had time to be outside, to be their quirky selves with all their unique interests and not have someone tell them that it was weird. Grateful for the friends I made. Grateful for the My Little Poppies community who started reading my silly little blog and told me their stories that were like my stories. And meeting Kara and connecting with her when I didn't have anybody locally who felt like that at the time. It took us years to find our people and the sisters community and just how you're just all very real life. I just really, I've loved the journey. I'm grateful. I'm, I'm proud of my kids. I'm proud of myself for doing something that was scary that I had no idea about and figuring it out. And I could say the same for even like Kara and I, proud of us for figuring out that podcast. So much of it was hard <laughs> figuring out never more learning. I still don't consider myself a technical person, but I think homeschool has just taught me like you just, you can learn anything. If you want to create a space for people to safely talk about unique learners and play and interest in learning, but there's like all this tech junk you have to do, but you want to do it, you can just do it. You just figure it out. Don't think more than six months ahead of time as a psychologist said. I'm grateful. I'm proud of everybody and I'm floored that it went by so fast and just very acutely aware of how old my kids are getting and just trying to enjoy the cool people they are before they leave for wherever they go next. And I feel fairly confident that we have created a home environment that they're going to want to come back to. And uh, yeah, the little old ladies in Target were right. It goes by so fast. I thought it was annoying when they were telling me in the checkout aisle, <laughs> when my kids were crying <laughs> and throwing things out of the cart, but they, they were right. No matter what stage of the game you are in, whether your kids are homeschooled, not homeschooled, partially homeschooled, whether you want to be here, whether you were thrust into it, whether you've always wanted to, I am thankful for you for listening, for being part of the community, and I want you to know that you've got this, sister. Talk to you later. Bye for now.